And this is Ken Kreitzer for CBSI Services Talking Business, our interview series talking with leaders in the field of digital marketing, banking, insurance, customer service, and business education. All to highlight the great work done by our team at CBSI based in Harrison, New York. We provide insurance-backed benefits to the credit card and payments industry and customer service management. Now, today we are very pleased to have a guest calling in from uh, New Hampshire. We're gonna talk a little bit about the United States Postal Service, and that is Christine Erna, who is the president of Strategic Postal Advisors and a, and a good friend we met through the New England Direct Marketing Association. Christine, how are you today? I am well, Ken. Thank you so much for having me this morning. It's a beautiful, crisp morning here in New Hampshire. <laughs> yeah, well, we got a sunny, warm day in uh, the New York uh, suburbs, and it's uh, uh, busy, been a busy time. And uh, yes. for many, many of us who have worked in, uh, you know, with the Direct Marketing Association for many years, and with uh, some of the successor groups, uh, and for many of our businesses, CBSI, we work with 1,200 banks around the country. And they're all dependent on the service provided by the United States Postal Service. They are. Email hasn't taken away statements. So it's been a lot happening. But first, Christine, tell us a little bit about your career, uh, uh, much of which has been in, in direct marketing, direct mail, working with the Postal Service. Thank you, Ken. And yes, I have been um, fortunate and blessed um, to have the career starting with the Postal Service early in my career. I did work for the Postal Service for 18 years and fortunate while there to go through their management training program. Uh, for me, that was a three-year program, um, learning all facets of the Postal Service operations. So I got to learn um, mail processing, delivery operations, um, supplies, uh, vehicle maintenance, labor relations, um, running a post office. I filled in as an officer in charge for six months in a post office. Um, managing delivery carriers out there delivering their routes. Um, working um, throughout the 24-hour operation at the Postal Service that they do, 24 hour, uh, six, seven days a week, 365 days a year. But that opportunity in the management training program um, just gave me so much knowledge and information on the Postal Service. Out of that program, I became what now is a mail piece design analyst position within the Postal Service. And I worked in that position for 10 years and loved that job. And that is working directly with um, the mailers, the marketers, um, to help them design their mail pieces so they're compatible to get the lowest postage rate on their mailings. And it's also working with the large transactional mailers and getting them to transition into, you know, full service automation. So when I left the Postal Service, I was fortunate um, to work in a mailing um, letter shop. So now I'm working on the other side, understanding and learning how the mail is going to the Postal Service. And while at the Postal Service, I was fortunate to attend and get a certificate in direct marketing, as well as obviously participated in the New England Direct Marketing Association, you know, in my position um, to support that industry. And that was the beautiful thing about that position. It was all about working with those mailers. And that's what I really love to do. So after working at the letter shop, I merged into the printing side of the industry. And at that time in the country was just as we were going through the recession in 2008 and 2009. So um, printers were looking to uh, morph their businesses, expand their services, um, become marketing service providers. A lot of them wanting to offer mailing services that they had never done before. So I went to work for a printing company to set up and establish a brand new letter shop operation in their business, which um, I did successfully. Um, they were ultimately sold um, and I moved on to another very large web press printer in New Hampshire um, who wanted to do the same thing. Um, they had outsourced their mailing services for 30 years and now they wanted to bring it internally. So I set up an internal letter shop for them. 
Um, then I went to work for Pitney Bowes as a postal consultant. And I love that job. And I worked in that job for um, the past 11 years before launching my new business in 2018. So I've had a varied and, and wide breadth of knowledge and experience that supports the entire um, supply chain of the direct mail and marketing industry. So I'll stop there and breathe and ask if you have any questions on that. Well, absolutely. We are so glad to be able to talk with you and, uh, and hear from your expertise. Uh, obviously, the United States Postal Service has been the subject of, of, a, of a lot of discussion and concern in recent months over the summer uh, with, uh, with some uh, changes that apparently that were made. What's your observation of what's been happening with the Postal Service over the last couple of months? So, you know, here we are, we're five months into our, you know, COVID um, experience here in the world. Um, every aspect has been affected, including the Postal Service. Uh, I'm very blessed and fortunate to still have friends on the inside. So I get some inside details as well. Um, but they, along with a lot of other businesses, have experienced an extraordinary amount of absenteeism with um, the COVID-19 pandemic, not unlike every other businesses. You know, they came out very, very early with a statement on, you know, how they were planning. Um, they put a COVID response team into place right away. They um, granted leave, additional leave to every employee um, to deal with COVID in their own lives, whether it was them sick themselves, supporting a family member, um, supporting their children, having to um, school from home, whatever the case may be. Um, but that additional leave on top of people that may have been out sick, on top of vacation time throughout the summer, um, certainly put them in a position uh, for lack of employees to move the mail. You compound that with um, the new Postmaster General arriving in mid-June, and it's not unlike every other Postmaster General that has arrived in that new position um, that they make changes. Um, some people wait and assess, others don't, and just make whatever changes they decide are necessary. In the case of Postmaster DeJoy, um, he came in from the private sector, that is no secret. Um, he has experience in the logistics side is my understanding, um, but he does not know how the internal operations of the Postal Service works and that there are certain things you can do and, and certain things you can't do and a lot of things that you should do. And one of the things that has been most obvious um, in my um, observation is his lack of communication to the industry. Um, there is a mailers technical advisory committee that meets every quarter with the Postal Service and the members of this committee have open access to people at headquarters. Um, including the Postmaster General, but he has not made himself available to speak with any members of the Mailers Technical Advisory Committee, um, nor the uh, Postal Policy Council, nor any of the other 60 associations um, that represent the mailers um, within the United States. Um, so that is very concerning um, for everyone within the industry. You know, as it relates to mail delay and overtime reductions and transportation, um, there are standard operating procedures for the operations um, for the Postal Service for a lot of businesses. But if you don't have the human capital to support those standard operating procedures and they can't just bring in anybody from the outside, they can't tell a letter carrier to go over and sort clerk's mail because they deal with four different unions. They have established bid jobs that says, I'm a clerk, I work 6 a.m. to 2, I sort mail, and then I work the window. 
a letter carrier cannot come over and do that job. And, you know, it would cause a grievance um, versus a, 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 a clerk cannot go and, and deliver the mail. That's not their job. So that is, you know, a restraint for the Postal Service that they can't move people where the need is necessary. So I'll stop there and ask if you have any questions on that. Well, you bring to mind, I, I had the privilege of sitting in a meeting with a senior U.S. Army officer, and he said when he took over a new command that he did a 100-day assessment of, of that base and that operation and what needed to uh, work and what was uh, doing fine. And it looks like uh, that Postmaster General Louis DeJoy came in with a, a set of uh, action items that he implemented very quickly. And the ones that we heard about were uh, reduced overtime, elimination of sorting equipment, uh, pulling the blue boxes off the street, and implementing what, we, what many might say would be a, an appropriate run the trucks on time, apparently, is, is motto. What were what, what, what of these actions um, do you feel had impact either positively or negatively? So again, those are part of the standard operating procedures that always exist. And um, I'm putting myself in the shoes of a postmaster or a supervisor or a mail processing, you know, distribution officer that, you know, every day that they walk in, they're down X number of employees that can't move the mail. And their staffing has been reduced, you know, over the years where there's no fat, you know, there's no extra employees around that, you know, they can just put in places. Um, overtime has always been there, um, and, and it's, it's just standard practice, especially during vacation time, that overtime is used. Um, can they curb it? Can the supervisors manage more closely to make sure everyone's doing their job in a, a timely and efficient manner? Absolutely. Um, but I think everyone is just kind of overwhelmed with the shortage of employees. Um, now that they're backed up in mail, it's only in certain areas. And I attended a webinar yesterday um, with some industry folks, and there was some excellent, excellent information. One of the industry people that use um, informed visibility that track mail delivery. The extent of letter size mail um, in, in certain periods have only been delayed one to two days, but it's the packages that have been backing up. And if you can well imagine in the last five months, the amount of online ordering and e-commerce that has just exploded um, and utilizing the postal service to deliver that, their parcel business is up 45%. Well, that's good. I mean, that's a revenue increase. And I have to say, on our street in White Plains, New York, on both Saturday and Sunday, was a truck delivering uh, uh, packages uh, to different homes. And, uh, and uh, we always go out of our way to thank the letter carriers and, and the delivery staff because they're out there in all different types of weather. They're out in the summer heat. They were out in the wintertime, in the snow, in the very cold temperatures, uh, delivering the mail, uh, a vital public service. Now, I, I guess uh, one of the questions that's been coming up um, is uh, how delivery will be in the fourth quarter. Now, you have the election mail. That's been a big topic of conversation. But for our business, uh, you know, it, it, the, the fourth quarter is a huge time for delivery of catalogs and, and different mailings, fundraising appeals, and so many other um, uh, seasonal uh, mailing efforts. How do you see the Postal Service being ready to, to handle this big fourth quarter of mail? Very good question. You know, Postmaster DeJoy sat, you know, in the hearing and indicated that the Postal Service could handle the volume of election mail, even with having taken out the sorting equipment that they have. And, you know, he had to rely on his operations people to tell him that. He does, you know, even two months into the job, he would not have the knowledge and expertise to understand the what they refer to as supply or the same period last year. And that's how they measure and manage the volume that they have to process. Last year, we processed X volume. 
and we use this many hours across different operations to do that. So they use models. If my volume increased by 1%, it would require this many additional hours. In yesterday's webinar that I attended, um, again, extraordinary intelligence and people commenting that the mail-in, uh, vote-by-mail ballot processing would only add one to two percent of volume to the postal service and very during a very you know limited window now before. that's such an important stat you mentioned i've heard that before but what but it, the election mail would only be a one to two percent increase in volume correct and it's it's not all coming on one day it's all not coming within two days it's going to be over a period of week or two weeks and and I don't doubt that they'll be able to process it. And we're talking with Christine Erna, who is the head of her own organization, Strategic Postal Advisors. And I just want to take a second to thank the New England Direct Marketing Association for introducing you to us. And uh, Mariah Hunt and her team does a great job. And, uh, oh, and so much of um, their organization evolved, as, as so many of us did, out of the direct mail business years ago. And maybe that's a question uh, to um, ask you about is how the business of the Postal Service has changed over the last 25 years or so. Uh, not that long ago in a holiday season, we would all receive a stack of two or three feet of catalogs. That doesn't happen anymore, but we get a handful. And, uh, and, there, and, and bank statements are not, uh, uh, a very large percent are, are sent by email, but uh, many of us say, you know, we read our statement a little more closely when we get a hard copy of it. Yes. And uh, and banks will have to send out notices uh, uh, during the year uh, to every uh, to every customer. How has the business changed, um, and how has the postal service changed as the uh, use of mail has changed over the last couple of decades? Thank you. Great question. And I've been fortunate to be in this industry to see that participate in it, you know, have a voice in it to educate people how to use mail, especially in changing technology. And that's probably the biggest change that I've seen in 25 years is the integration of technology with the physical mail. Um, obviously, the technology within the industry of, of you know, marketing and, and data mining and, and the ability to target recipients. You know, 25 and 30 years ago were the days of spray and pray. People, postage was low, paper was cheap. You could just, and that's where your catalogs were. You could print, you know, 100 page catalog, hundreds of page catalogs and mail them out pretty inexpensively. But as we learned in New England direct marketing, it's about targeting, it's about response rate, it is about conversion, it is about the call to action and making sure that that call to action um, is enticing for that recipient. I love the male moment. You know, the male moment in my home is wonderful. My husband is a former postal employee, retired, Oh, he's got eight years going now in retirement, but he was a postmaster here in New Hampshire. Um, but every day he just, you know, he asks me, did we get any mail in informed delivery, which is a service from the Postal Service, the use of technology. You can now get an email every morning and show you a grayscale image of what's going to be in your mailbox. Well, wow, we've got to try that. Uh, we'll have I to. I could uh, not even think that. of that 25 years ago. So you go on to the USPS.com website and right on the front page, there will be um, informed delivery. And as a consumer, you can sign up and receive a daily email message that will show you what's going to be in your mailbox for letter size mail. It shows some flat size mail and it gives you information about your parcels, not pictures of them, but the tracking number. So, but now marketers are using the informed delivery service to entice mailers with a physical digital experience. So now I'm sending out a mailing 
and I can replace my grayscale image in the inbox with a representative image or a color image of the mail piece and have a URL click on, on click behind that. So it takes you to a digital experience from that physical mail piece. Well, that's terrific. Uh, and uh, that's something we'll put a link to how you can sign up in the comments uh, to our interview today. And that's a very a good service for people to be aware of and try out. Now, one of the things you, uh, you hinted at is uh, the give and take there's been between the Postal Service and the industry uh, on, on postal rates. Uh, I've sat in on a bunch of uh, it used to be the Direct Marketing Association meetings, uh, talking with, uh, uh, with the post office about uh, the impact of, of keeping uh, various classes of mail rates affordable uh, for, uh, for business mailers. Uh, tell us about, now some, some of that has led um, some uh, politicians to say, well, the Postal Service is underpricing its product and subsidizing some businesses like Amazon or others. How do you see that on, on pricing? Is that something that uh, needs adjustment or is a, a fair investment by the country uh, in this vital service? So quite interesting how the rate making process happens at the Postal Service. And I wanna highlight, and that's been one of the um, comments that we heard um, lately is, this is a public service. This is not a private business. This is a government agency providing a public service. It is not supposed to be a revenue revenue making um, organization. It is supposed to break even um, based upon the rates uh, rate setting structure. And they changed how the rate setting structure um, happens back in 2006 where they're now tying the Postal Service's ability to raise rates against what the current consumer price index is. So every quarter the consumer price index measurement comes out and if the Postal Service decides that it needs or wants to raise rates, it has to provide a 90 day notice and it can only go up as much as the CPI. So if their operational costs have increased, um, let's say gas, you know, gas prices went out of the roof and, and you know, CPI was 2.91%, but their operational costs went up 25%, they can't change postage rates more than that unless they went into what they call an exigent rate case. And that did happen back in 2009 um, after the 2006 rate changing process with the recession that hit. And it's important for people to understand that 2006 was the largest, was the year of the largest volume of mail that the Postal Service ever processed. And it was 206 billion mail pieces. 206 billion mail pieces. It's a uh, uh, almost a billion pieces a, a delivery day. And, and, and it's it's mind boggling to put your mind around how much volume that is. How have the volumes maintain themselves uh, uh, since then? Interesting. So um, when the recession hit, they immediately lost 20% of their first class mail, which is the largest revenue generating, revenue generating from the point of, that's where they make the most money. Which, which recession do, it was, are, you, are you thinking about? 2008, 2009. Gotcha. So again, the peak volume was 2006. By 2010, the volume was down to 160 billion. And now we're at hovering at about 152 billion. So it's about a half a billion a delivery day. That's, still, That's a still. significant drop. And now since COVID, the impact of the transactional and first class mail has not been as big of impact, just like you indicated, because of you know, the financial institutions, insurance companies, and healthcare that are required to send 
certain documents through first class mail. So they've seen a drop of two to four percent in the last five months. But it's the marketing side, the marketing mail that has dropped drastically in, in the 45 to 50 percent range. Well, we've heard different uh, comments on that. Bruce Beagle spoke of that uh, from the Winterberry Group at the at a session a couple of months ago from at the New York Direct Marketing Club. He saw a big drop off. We talked to Mark Ricard of Ricard Square out on Long Island, another industry expert. He said he didn't see as much drop off as as others, uh, but the, there certainly is some. I still say, like you, that uh, you know, working from home the last uh, four or five months, you know, getting the mail each day is a highlight. It is. It is. And, and you know, how much mail is in there is the question. And what can we do as an industry to promote people mailing? Um, there are currently three available promotions available from the Postal Service um, that um, one of them is tied into informed delivery. Um, one is for color trans promo for those transactional documents. And one is um, mobile shopping. And those are all good through the end of the year. Well, let me let me rephrase that. Some of them are good through the end of the year. Um, there is also an additional incentive that was put out there by the Postal Service for small businesses with their direct mail program called Every Door Direct Mail. And this is where a small business can send geographically to a concentrated area around their business. And they can send a mail piece without addressing the mail piece to a person or an address. It just says postal customer or neighborhood friend. And the letter carrier delivers one to everyone on their carrier route. And currently there is a 10% discount um, on the postage for that promotion through the end of September. And again, encouraging people to use the mail and announce that their business is open, announce how their business has changed in reopening, whatever message that small businesses need to get out there, and that's a great way to do it. Well, my dentist uh, periodically sends a postcard reminding me I have an appointment, and uh, having that piece of paper with a phone number in front of you is an incentive to uh, pick up the phone and make that appointment. Uh, we've been, uh, you know, even the, I thought the, direct, the New England Direct Marketing Association last uh, year had a nice session on when direct mail really stands out. And we see today that uh, uh, people who are frequent catalog purchasers online now will receive a hard copy of the catalog in the mail so that they can see a wider list of uh, choices. Certainly, uh, uh, fundraisers are trying to stay visible in people's mailboxes. We've gotten several and even a, a very nice co uh, college magazine that had a lot of readable material. Um, and how they're handling the pandemic I got yesterday and I took a long read of that at lunchtime. What are some of the ways of using the Postal Service, using direct mail that, that you uh, frequently recommend to your clients? So um, ironically, I was, um, I participated in um, an industry event yesterday going on today and tomorrow called Elevate Print. And um, it's an industry, um, with tons of great speakers and encouraging um, people to do everything they can to encourage people to print and mail. And I presented on the direct mail programs um, with a colleague um, that um, went very well, but it was talking about the US Postal Service promotions. Um, it's a great way to save money and everyone wants to save money. Budgets have blown up, but the important thing is to get your message out there. These three promotions offer a 2% discount at the time of mailing, off of your mailing. So that's encouraging uh, for customers that they can now either mail more or truly save on their postage. Um, if they're saving 2%, maybe they can mail 2% more um, so that they're reaching a wider audience. And what I recommend to customers, um, and, and I do a lot of education within the industry is making sure that you clean your address lists, you're targeting your customers appropriately for the right message, and that um, you have a great follow-up mechanism. There's nothing worse than a customer reaching out and that you got too many leads that you can't follow up with, um, making sure that you've got an appropriate planned campaign from beginning to end. 
Um, but the promotions is a great way to save money as well as the EDDM. Uh, from the transactional side, um, I've been working with customers to support them in setting up informed visibility, um, secure destruction, that works on the transactional side uh, for the large volume mailers, as well as getting visibility into um, their Postal One system and their mailer scorecard for full service. You know, one of the big changes for large volume mailers that's coming um, on the horizon is that everyone will be seamless acceptance at the Postal Service. And this is important to ensure that the quality of the mail that you're presenting is meeting the Postal Service uh, requirements there. Very good. Now, one question I wanted to ask you and is uh, uh, I do a lot of work for veterans organizations supporting veterans and people in the military. And one of the things that we noticed is there are many veterans who work in the U.S. Postal Service and uh, uh, there are some uh, pension uh, uh, considerations that have, that have encouraged that. Tell us a little bit about uh, uh, why there's a lot of veterans in the Postal Service. So yes, and I think the Postal Service is probably one of the largest employers of veterans in the country. Um, as a government agency, they provide a 5% um, a five point benefit on the Postal Service exam to join the Postal Service. So every veteran that takes the test to join the Postal Service gets an additional five points on their score. And that enables them to um, hire more veterans first before the John Q public because of the service that they have already provided. And um, within the Postal Service, um, veterans, um, they're, they're amazing. You know, the service that they've first provided to their country um, and then coming from the military and working in the Postal Service, you know, they have a work ethic that is second to none. Um, that the work gets done, they follow instructions, and they rise within the organization into leadership roles, which is good. And what was the second part of that question on the um, veterans? Well, just uh, you mentioned that they're, they're uh, part of the pension fund. Yes, and that's the been obviously uh, in, in looking at the Postal Service's uh, financial situation over a number of decades. This is not a new question. Uh, the pension funds have been a concern and the pension obligation. Uh, uh, Postal Service leaders have said in the past they could run a break even without the pension fund obligation that Congress has mandated. Tell us a little bit about the background to that and, uh, and its current situation. Sure. So um, two different um, things here. So veterans, so their um, time in service, um, in the military service, gets applied to their retirement date within the Postal Service. So a veteran starting on day one already is already considered having, if they serve four years in the military, four years in the Postal Service because they're using their military time as the retirement date. So the Postal Service, depending upon when you got hired, um, when I went to work for the Postal Service, I got hired in 1984. In the beginning of 1984 is when the Postal Service transitioned from a civil service retirement system to the federal employees retirement system. The civil service retirement system um, was a, a retirement program where retirees never paid into Social Security and um, they have a pension from the Postal Service um, guaranteed for life um, with health benefits. Um, retirees do have to pay a portion of their health benefits and their life insurance and their dental insurance. The Postal Service pays a portion as well as the, the retiree. So veterans, um, so again, after 1984, the federal employee retirement system um, kicks into play. So now um, federal employee retirement system requires a contribution, though you in civil service, you're paying a contribution into that retirement system as well. Uh, but in the federal employee retirement system, um, it's like a 401k. 
So when I resigned from the Postal Service, I was able to take my retirement benefits with me. In civil service, you, if you left the Postal Service, you received no benefit for retirement. So with the health care pre-funding of um, requirement that was part of the 2006 Postal um, Accountability Act, it required the Postal Service to pre-fund uh, future retirees' health benefits for 75 years to the tune of $5 billion, and they had to pay that over 10 years. And that's had a big impact on, on the finances. What is the financial uh, situation of the post office? Uh, is it uh, near break even or is there a large deficit uh, mounting? Well, there's a deficit every year because of this $5 billion that they have defaulted on since I want to say about 2009 or 2010 when they lost all the volume and they had no revenue. So they have defaulted on that $5 billion payment for the last, you know, seven or eight, nine years. And um, they have still had ups and downs. If you take that $5 billion out of the equation, um, as they're supposed to, as is the rate setting process, that every postage rate covers the cost of the class that it's processing. And the cycle is, is, if I raise rates today, that will cover the cost until the next rate setting cycle. Before 2006, they may go two or three years before they change rates. But under the new structure, and only being able to raise the rates according to what CPI is, they've gotten into an annual rate change because they can't go up more and and that impacts their operational costs and whether or not they come out the other side break even in the red and they haven't had a positive year in quite some time well certainly the postal service has huge fixed costs in terms of uh, uh buildings uh key staff um uh and and all the all of the services that go into delivering to uh to every zip code in in the country uh, on a, on a five or six day a week uh, basis. Now, they, the House of Representatives this week approved a measure that would provide $25 billion to the Postal Service. Now, it's certainly unclear what the Senate uh, may do with that legislation. Um, it certainly could be considerably changed on what the president might do with it. What, what kind of funding would help the Postal Service in, at, this, at this moment? So the $25 billion, as I understand it, is to um, support the Postal Service's um, extra expenditures around COVID-19 and that they've got to be able to document every expense that they're using this $25 billion for after they cover all their COVID-19 expenses. If there is anything left over, they have to return it to the treasury. So that is not supporting the Postal Service outside of COVID-19. Well, that's interesting because as you said, their big uh, challenge long-term is the uh, pension fund obligation. I know we're kind of running out at the end of our window. Are there, are are. there measures that you would like to see the Postal Service implement in the coming years to improve efficiency and, um, and uh, maintain the service they provide to the country? Um, again, the Postal Service's hands are tied right now um, with the legislation that is currently in place. And the legislation needs to change. And if anything that DeJoy, uh, Postmaster DeJoy has done has raised the awareness to everybody in this country and most importantly, our elected officials, that the Postal Service need support and change in legislation, not to become a business, but to be able to provide the service to continue that they've been doing for 240 years. Every American relies on the service, and I hope that that change comes in, in the not too distant future. Well, we uh, join you uh, 
and applaud the uh, efforts of the United States Postal Service. Uh, as you said, many veterans work for the organization. We see them in, the, in all kinds of weather, hot, yes. the heat of the summer like we have now, and we just had in the uh, cold weather and the rain and the snow. And also uh, quickly reestablishing postal delivery when there's emergencies, when the hurricanes or yes. tornadoes have struck communities and the vital service that they play in so many situations. We uh, just want to shout out to all of the members of the Postal Service for the great job they do. And Christina Erna, I just want to say thank you for your time today and uh, telling us about your and sharing your extraordinary expertise in working with the United States Postal Service. You are the president of Strategic Postal Advisors located in New Hampshire. What town in New Hampshire? It's called Plasto, right on the border of Massachusetts um, over near the coast. Okay, and we'll provide your contact info. Um, and we want to thank the Hudson, the uh, the uh, New England Direct Marketing Association, who introduced uh, you to us and uh, and their leadership. Uh, uh, and Mariah Hunt does a great job with that. Uh, and we uh, thank uh, that organization. Um, and just really uh, want to thank you for your time today and and telling us about uh, uh, what you see happening with uh, the U.S. Postal Service. Thank you, Ken, for having me. I thoroughly enjoyed the conversation and look forward to the next one. Yeah, we'll, we'll do it again very soon, I'm sure. Christina Erna, thank you very much from Strategic Postal Advisors. And this is Ken Kratzer for CBSI Services, our Talking Business interview series, all to highlight the work of our team in Harrison, New York, uh, taking care of our clients in the banking and payments industry all through this uh, pandemic. And uh, so, uh, uh, from my home office here in White Plains, New York. This is Ken Kratzer. Have a good day, everybody.